Okay, in the previous video, we uh, talked about viscoelasticity, and specifically, we looked at this case where you, um, you know, you, you you put a heavy table onto a carpeted floor. That's a carpet. Okay, so we, we've put a heavy table onto a carpeted floor, and then we remove it, and you see a little divot. You see this this flat spot where the leg of the table was. If you put it there for a short period of time, you, know, you see the divot for less. Uh, less pronounced divot and it doesn't last as long if, if it's there for uh, the table is there for a long time like a year or something the divot might actually last for a long time even after you move the table away and so what we're observing in this case here is you've applied a fixed load that is the force doesn't change with time but over time what actually happened is and it's difficult for me to, to sketch it but the, the table actually with time I mean if you left it there, there for a couple of years the table actually would have pushed into the um, into the carpet even further. So, in this example, we had a fixed load, and we observed the strain. So that is a nice example to start with for describing viscoelasticity. But the way that it, uh, one way at least that it's often quantified is by doing this by applying a fixed strain okay we apply a fixed strain epsilon naught and then observe the stress decreasing as a function of time so that would be sigma in parentheses t for as a function of time okay that's decreasing or when things you know, fibers uh, elongate, we, we could also say it's relaxing. Okay, the stress is relaxing as a function of time or with time. Okay, a little more difficult to think of everyday examples um, where you might see that, but, um, you know, one example would be um, perhaps tuning in, tune in a guitar, and if you, you, you tune in the, the tension in the string, um, and the length of the guitar doesn't change with time, but with enough time, the stress will decrease so that the guitar string, a nylon string at least, would go out of tune, even without any kind of a humidity or temperature change in, in the guitar. Um, anyway, if you think of some other examples, let me know. Um, but in the lab, it's quite easy to do. You can put it into a tensile testing machine and stop the strain. So the strain is fixed at a certain value that you determine, and all you need to do is use the strain... Uh, the load cell to uh, give you the load and you can calculate stress. So it's quite easy to do and in fact if you do that for most polymers um, and we were to plot the um, ah, you know what I didn't introduce that let me introduce this what so <laughs> we could we could we want to describe essentially the stress decreasing. So we, we want to see, I mean, in fact, what I'll do is I'm going to go like this. I'm going to put stress as a function of time here uh, versus time. And what would you expect to happen? So you apply a fixed load, you elongate a sample, you stretch it out, and then, you know, so what might it look like? So you take a sample like this, and then you stretch it out by applying some load and you fixed though this final length so that you've you've fixed the you've fixed the strain at some values delta l over l naught um, is is fixed and you hold it there and then all you need to do is observe the stress that is needed to maintain that length and that's the stress. <clears throat> so what's that going to look like with time? Well, it's stress relaxation. Polymer, you remember, is made up of all these little fibers, these, these not fibers, correction, molecules. And with enough time, they can overcome those weak secondary interactions and move past each other. So the stress, we, should, we would expect some kind of a downward trend in the stress. So the stress decreases with time. Now, what we can do, and this is what we actually do, is we, we define 
this new term. It's a special number, so we're going to call it a modulus, because that's all a modulus means, a special number. So let's define a special number that describes relaxation of a polymer. So let's call it the relaxation modulus. Relaxation modulus. Modulus. So that's going to be E with a lowercase, uh, sorry, subscript R. And that's just defined as that time dependent stress divided by the strain that we impose on the sample. Okay, so that's the relaxation modulus. So now what I could do is actually I could go back over to this little, um, okay, here we go. So erase that. What we could actually do is, is replace that stress as a function of time with this new term, relaxation modulus. So we're going to put in here the relaxation modulus as a function of time. Now, technically, if we're going to be careful here, this relaxation modulus covers many orders of magnitude, you know, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So we're going, it covers a huge range of data. Now, if we want to cover a lot of data, one way that we can deal with that is to um, plot it on a, a logarithmic axis or take the log of the value. So that they would, now we're just working in, in, we're in orders of magnitude steps. We're compressing the data, if you will. Do the same thing to, to the time to cover lots of range of time and take a look at the curves. And we'll see that um, we get a decrease in the, essentially the stress as a function of time. But the other thing I want to show you is, well, if you give the system more energy, that is, you apply a, a higher temperature, so T1 less than T2, less than, I'll write T3 out in a moment, you find that the, the slope decreases even more rapidly as you get to higher <clears throat> and higher temperatures. And hopefully, again, that makes some sense. When you consider the structure of a polymer, there's more kinetic energy. It's going to be more likely to overcome all these little weak secondary interactions between chains um, with that increasing um, thermal energy at higher temperatures. So, so that's w w all well and good. Um, but what if we'd like to look at relaxation modulus versus temperature? In fact, this is quite quite interesting. What we, we what we we could do is just define a temp a time rather. Okay, say uh, you know some some time. I don't know. Oops, um, ten seconds perhaps. Okay, and fix that time. And then observe what the stress is relaxed to for each of the temperatures. And then we can plot now relaxation modulus versus temperature. So it's quite interesting. And if we do that, again, we want to plot a lot of um, a large range of data for relaxation modulus. So we'll take a log of that. And then we'll plot it now versus temperature. But temperatures are not covering a huge range because these are terrestrial temperatures. Temperatures close to room temperature. Okay, close. Whoops. Close to room temperature. Close to room temperature. Temperatures that humans are interacting with. Um, or close to that, at least, you know. Freezing to a couple hundred degrees C, something like that. And we're going to plot now the relaxation modulus um, after 10 seconds for uh, these different... Um, temperatures. And if you did that and you did a number of uh, tests, you'd find for a lot of polymers, it's something that looked kind of like this. Now, technically, this is actually um, a semi-crystalline polymer. Semi-crystalline. And we'll get to that in a, in a moment. Semi-crystalline polymer. But at the low temperatures here, this is low temperature, right? And this is high. At the low temperatures, uh, as you might expect, polymers are kind of brittle. There's in not enough kinetic energy or thermal energy um, in the vibrations of these, these molecules to overcome these secondary interactions between chains. And so the polymer molecules essentially are kind of are locked in place. And so it's, it's kind of hard and brittle. And so we use this common term. Um, it's a bit of a misuse of the term, really, but glassy. In this, in this case here, referring to the mechanical properties. Okay, not the microstructure. Because you may know that um, 
mechanical properties only. Okay, that's what we're referring to, not the structure. Because glassy, in a really strict sense, in, in material science, um, refers to the absence of crystal structure, no long-range order. But th in this case, glassy is not used in that sense. It's used to refer to uh, a hard and brittle. Okay, molecules can't slide past each other, so they're held in place, and then it's, it's hard and brittle. And then out here in this region, the polymer... Uh, it's a high temperature, it's, just, it's, it's melted. And so we, we describe this region as viscous flow, flow of a liquid. Okay, and in that region, the molecules are all free to move um, past one another. But there's some interesting things that happen in between that. And so around here, we, dis we define this melting temperature. Okay, melting temperature. And that's pretty easy to um, wrap your head around, I think. Um, it becomes a liquid, and that's, that's, that's fine. But the interesting thing is that we also have to define another temperature, which is the glass transition temperature. And to really fully understand this, we need a little bit of a better model for the microstructure of a polymer than the one that I've shown you there. So this polymer, which I said is a semi-crystalline polymer, is the case for a lot of polymers, not all, but many. And their microstructure looks something like this. There's some regions of crystallinity where the polymer molecules are organized, and there's other regions, and this is a cartoon sketch of the polymer microstructure, or the, I could just say polymer molecules, okay? So there's some disorganized regions, and then there's some organized regions. Some disorganized, and some organized. Okay? So that's a nice little cartoon sketch of uh, polymer microstructure. And so we've got these disorganized regions, or amorphous. Amorphous meaning lack of crystal structure, lack of long-range order. And then we've got these other ones, regions that are highly organized. And so the name for that is crystalline. So there's both crystalline and amorphous regions. And again, if we think about these secondary interactions that are established between molecules, well, in the crystalline region, the density is actually higher. Okay, and a great example of this is high-density polyethylene. Um, okay, so just for example, high-density polyethylene. The high density is achieved by designing the polymer structure such that it more readily crystallizes and achieves a higher density, and it's got higher temperature resistance versus low-density polyethylene. Chemistry is the same, but the microstructure is, is different. I don't know why I wrote a second line underneath the E. Um, but the, the, there's less uh, crystallinity in low-density polyethylene, and um, that's because... Uh, oh, sorry, and that leads to the density difference. So this is higher density, and as a, as a product of that, the, the molecules are closer together, of course, and so there's more opportunities to establish secondary interactions in the crystalline domain, and that's what those little red lines are supposed to be. Those are supposed to be secondary interactions okay versus in the amorphous region where there's fewer places where the molecules are, are relatively close together and so there's fewer of those secondary interactions in the uh, amorphous regions higher density here for crystalline and more numerous secondary bonds or interactions and um, by contrast, the amorphous has fewer secondary interactions. So now what we can do is we will scroll back up here to our relaxation modulus curve and think about what's happening upon, upon heating this. So we start off at low temperature, and all these molecules here, the crystalline and, and amorphous, they're all, they're, they're all locked in place. And we continue to increase the temperature. So we're giving more thermal energy, more uh, movement of the molecules, and the first thing that we're going to find happens is the molecules in the 
um, in the amorphous region get enough energy to overcome the um, the secondary interactions between molecules. And that's what happens at the TG, at the glass transition temperature. And we see a rapid decrease in the relaxation modulus. So at, um, or I could say, I could say this, upon heating then, right, the first thing that happens is we free up these amorphous regions. Amorphous regions have enough um, energy to overcome or break the secondary interactions uh, interactions between the molecules and that's at what point at the um, TG the glass transition temperature and then continue to heat it up right continue to heat up and then you hit the TM and the TM the melting temperature is where you've got enough kinetic energy or thermal energy for the molecules to overcome all those little secondary interactions in the crystalline domains all right so similarly upon heating at the TM the same thing happens in the crystalline regions so they can overcome the secondary interactions between molecules okay excellent so now we understand why there's a need with polymers for both a TG glass transition and a TM uh, melting temperature